Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another Zoom in on a fresh conversation. But today we're going to be concentrating on the fact that we are celebrating Black History Month. And as most of you know, we are doing the International Great Black Read Aloud Day. But Janice Kearney, yay, thank you for coming, has graciously... Um, giving us some time so that we can reflect on the memory of Toni Morrison. But in the, but before she does that, I want to give you just, because she's Black history herself, right? So I want to give you just a little bit snippet of uh, Miss Janice F. Kearney, who she is and what she has done in uh, her lifetime. So Janice was born in... Um, I won't give the year, but she was born in Gould, Arkansas, to Ethel F. Curry Kearney and Thomas James Kearney. She is the 14th of 19 children. Oh, my goodness. Janice's <laughs> father was a sharecropper, and her mother was a homemaker who spent most of her, most of her time assisting her father with the family's cotton fields. Kearney was hired by the state of Arkansas in 1978, where she spent three years as a program manager for the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act program, and another six years as director of information for the national headquarters of the Migrant Student Records Transfer System. In 1987, she became the managing edit editor of the Arkansas State press newspaper owned and operated by civil rights activist Daisy Bates. Three months after Janice joined the paper, Daisy, <laughs> Miss Bates retired and Kearney bought the, the company. I know that had to be, we're like, what? Uh, Janice published the weekly newspaper in Arkansas for five years. Uh, the Arkansas State press newspaper. In 1995, Kearney was appointed to serve as the first ever personal diarist to President William Jefferson Clinton. Now, it says the first ever personal diarist, but you were the first Black ever. Is that correct? I was the first personal diarist to a president. There is theory. There are presidential diarists Right. Which are, you know, that's a whole different thing. I was the first period. Period. Uh, so that's, you know, that's Black history right there, you guys. Yeah. She's an award-winning author and 2004 through her own publishing company, Writing Our World Press. She published Cotton Field of Dreams and 2008, her first novel, Once Upon a Time, There Was a Girl, A Murder at Mobile Bay. And consequently, she then went on to write Daisy, Between a Rock and a Hard Place, Something to Write Home About, Conversations from Hope to Harlem with William Jefferson Clinton, and many more. Her current project, Mahalia, which focuses on the life of Mahalia Jackson, will be published in 2021. 2021. Welcome and thank you for being a part of Black History and taking the time to remember Toni Morrison through your lens. Thank you very much, my friend, for being here. Thank you, Donna. Thank you for having me. Thank you for all you do for literacy and literature. My pleasure. And especially African-American literature. So it is my pleasure to be here. And I just want to throw out that Daisy Bates played such an important role in my life. Oh, yeah. Today, we are celebrating Daisy Bates' holiday here in Arkansas. Oh, nice. She has, she has her own holiday. So I... Uh, and I just finished actually talking on doing a Zoom event around her birthday. So not a birthday. And so were you responsible for Daisy Bates getting her own day there? No, in I was okay. not. A friend of mine was, but I was not. But I was just so excited when I learned that that it was happening. Mm. Yeah. So I'm congratulations to you in Arkansas. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to talk some about Toni Morrison, who is also probably considered one of the most brilliant writers in mm -hmm. the world, really, uh, certainly in our country. She has done some, uh, she's won awards that nobody else has won. So I just think her writing is amazing. That is the truth. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. So I'm going to, I I have done this one before, and I'm hoping that if you've heard this before, you will pretend to yourself that you hadn't. Um, but this is my ode to, to Toni Morrison. Mm. Um, I'm honored 
to briefly pay homage to the late great artist, Clo Anthony Walker Morrison, known as Tony Morrison, born in, in February, February 18, 1931 in Lorraine, Ohio, and who left us on August 19th, 2019. And I would say she left an amazing literary legacy, a catalog of brilliant works, and she also left a void in the literary landscape. And I always liked the name Tony for a girl, T-O-N-I. -I. I thought it was really cool. But then in research, I learned that her name was not really Tony, but she took on the name Tony when she went through her uh, Catholic uh, transformation. And she took on Anthony after Anthony of Padua. Oh, and wow. Yeah, and she adopted that name and people just called her Tony for short and it stuck. She attended Lorraine High School in Ohio and then she went to Howard University in Washington, DC, which is very prominent all over the country now. Everybody knows Howard. <laughs> uh, in 1949, that's when she enrolled there. And then she graduated in 1953 with a BA in English and mm -hmm. went on to earn a master's of arts from Cornell University mm -hmm. in 1955. And her master's thesis was titled Virginia Woolf's and William Faulkner's Treatment of the Alienated. And wow. I haven't read that yet, but I'm going. Me either. To I need to get so that. Yeah. Provocative titles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she taught <clears throat> English at Texas Southern University in Houston from 1955 to 1957, and then at Howard University for the next seven years. While teaching at Howard, she met Harold Morrison, who is a Jamaican architect, and she married. They married in 1958. They had two sons, and, but they divorced while she was pregnant with her second son. Um, she began in 1965 as an editor for L.W. Singer, a textbook division of publisher Random House. And two years later, she transferred to Random House in New York City, and that's where she worked for, for almost 20 years, I think. Almost, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, and she became their first black woman senior editor in the fiction department. Um, but shortly after she went to work there, she uh, started on her book. Uh, she was more than just an editor, she was also a writer. And over the next 40 years, she would gift the world with some extraordinary books, plays, operas, and film. Uh, she began writing fiction as part of an informal group that she belonged to when she was at Howard. Uh, and she attended one meeting with a short story about a black girl who longed to have blue eyes. Mm. Uh, and she later developed that story as her first novel. Guess what the name of it was? The Bluest Eye. Bluest Eyes. Uh-huh. And she tells the story of how she got up every morning at 4 eight, four a.m. to write while her two boys were still sleeping. And then she'd write more when she rode the train from her home to, into work. And that book was published in 1970. Um, Morrison was 39 at the time. It was favorably reviewed in the New York Times who praised uh, Morrison's writing style as a prose so precise, so faithful to speech, mm -hmm. And so charged with pain and wonder that the novel becomes poetry. Uh, it did not sell well at first, but the City University of New York put the Bluest Eye on its reading list for its new Black Studies department. So she sold lots of, of copies of the book after that. And it also brought more attention to her. Mm. Uh, and she ended up with a, an agent and a publisher who she worked with for the rest of her career. Uh, her second novel, Sula, which was published in 1973, is about a friendship between two black women. And it was nominated for the National, black Award, the National Book Award, I'm sorry. Her third novel, 
Song of Solomon, published in 1977, follows the life of Macon Milkman Dead the <laughs> Third from birth to, to adulthood as he discovers his heritage through the magic of the Black experience. This novel brought her national acclaim, uh, being a main selection of the Book of the Month Club. Um, and that was the first time that a novel by a Black writer had been chosen since Richard Wright's Native Son mm. in 1940. Song of Solomon, Solomon also won the National Book Critics Circle Award. As an editor, she changed the world of publishing with her ability to secure Black artists who most likely would never have been picked up by a random house uh, or other publishers had Toni Morrison not been there. She played a vital role in bringing Black literature into the mainstream. One of the first books she worked on was the groundbreaking Contemporary African Literature in 1972, a collection that included work by Nigerian writers Soyinka, Achebe, and South African playwright Fugard. She fostered a new generation of Afro-American writers, including Tony Bambera, radical activist Angela Davis, uh, Black Panther Huey Newton, and novelist Gail Jones, whose writing Morrison discovered. She also brought to publication the 1975 autobiography of the outspoken boxing champion, Muhammad Ali, in his uh, book, The Greatest, My Own Story, and a little known novelist and poet, um, Henry Dumas, a, uh, who had been shot to death by a transit officer in New York City. Uh, she also developed and edited the Black Book, an anthology of photographs, illustrations, essays, and other documents of Black life in the United States from the time of slavery to the 1920s. So uh, she has done much. And I, I don't think people knew how much she had contributed to Black literature. They knew what she did, her own writing, but they didn't know that she had contributed in other ways. Um, I don't think I speak out of turn when I say that Toni Morrison was incomparable in her literary genius. It wasn't just that she was the first African-American woman to win both a Nobel Peace Prize and the Pulitzer Prize, but it is, uh, it is because her writing was just so deep. Uh, and that is not to say that there are not a long list of other writers uh, who should be, be recognized. In 1983, she left publishing to devote more time to writing. Um, she taught English, she kept teaching, she was still teaching. She taught at two branches of the State University of New York uh, and at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. And she was appointed to an Albert Schweitzer chair at the University at Albany. Her first play, Dreaming Emmett, is about the 1955 murder by white men of black teenager Emmett Till. And it was performed in 1986 at the State University of New York at Albany. In ninth, it was 1988 when she won the Pulitzer Prize for Beloved, which was published in 1987 and made into a film 10 years, a little over 10 years later in 1998. And in 1993, she became world renowned, which she was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1993. Uh, the first African-American woman to win that prize. Beloved is considered a notch above Invisible Man in terms of celebrity mm -hmm. and, and shares with it a basic theme. Her first novel, The Bluest Eye, grew out of a short story she wrote, as I already mentioned, in, at, in undergraduate school. Um, it surprised her colleagues who had no idea that this editor uh, was also writer. such a great writer. Uh, I'm skipping around. Beloved is Morrison's fifth and most 
popular novel. Though she is not interested in real life people as subjects for fiction, there is a real life figure, Margaret Garner, behind her, her protagonist, Seth. She said, I really don't know anything about her, though a name is something and the fact of her tragedy is something too. These are adequate occasions and do not entail appropriation. She read, in fact, two interviews and said to herself, isn't this extraordinary? Here's a woman who escaped into Cincinnati from the horrors of slavery mm. and was not crazy. Though she'd killed her child, she was not foaming at the mouth. She was very calm. She said, I'd do it again. That was more than enough to fire my imagination. Uh, in 1996, uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities selected her for the Jefferson Lecture, uh, the US federal government's highest honor for achievement in the humanities. Also that year, she was honored with the National Book Foundation's Medal of Distinguished Contribution mm -hmm. to American Letters. Uh, on May 29th, 2012, President Barack Obama presented Morrison with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Yes. In 2016, she received the Penn Saul Bellow Award for Achievement in American Fiction. And in 2020, Morrison was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. In her Nobel acceptance speech, she talked about the power of storytelling. To make her point, she told a story she spoke about a blind old black woman who was approached by a group of young people. They demanded of her, is there no context for our lives? No song, no literature, no poem full of vitamins, no history connect, connected to experience that you can pass along? Think of our lives and tell us your particularized world. Make up a story. That is what she implored of the audience. So my take is Toni Morrison was brave and a risk taker. Mm. She dared to go deeper and broader in her imagination of personal lives and what those lives meant for the broader world. I read somewhere that she didn't think her life was interesting enough for a memoir. Can you imagine that? I can't. <laughs> I can't. What is exciting about American literature is that business of how writers say things under, beneath, and around their stories. Think of Puddinghead Wilson and all those inversions of what race is, how mm -hmm. sometimes nobody can tell or the thrill of discovery. Though she returned a publisher's advance for an autobiography, on the grounds that her life was not of sufficient interest to sustain such a book, she is content to have her fiction considered as personal narrative alongside memoirs and autobiographies. She is deadly serious, serious she insists, about establishing the Malou out of which I write and from which my ancestors actually lived. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about my only personal interaction with Toni Morrison. I met her in, in the early 1990s at a literary awards program in New York. Toni was an honoree and I was just very, very blessed that the gods uh, smiled down at me and let me sit right next to her. I wasn't the only one in awe that night. Everybody was gaga, goo goo. <laughs> I would have been. <laughs> Everyone at the table was, and they, <laughs> were, <laughs> they looked from her to me, wondering if we knew each other. And of course, we didn't. so I, I really couldn't believe that I was sitting right next to her. Um, I knew I was ready to begin my journey of writing. I was still at the White House working but it was just a couple of years before I'd leave. So I knew what I was gonna be doing. So I had all these questions in my mind that I wanted to ask her uh, about writing. And, you know, just as I was beginning to 
To do that though, she began to ask me questions. She was fascinated that Bill Clinton had a black personal diarist and she had a million questions for me. And she was also fascinated by William Jefferson Clinton, uh, the whole dynamic of him being from the South and him being considered uh, the first black president. And I think she was the person who first kind of coined that. <laughs> but she said, because of all the things that he had gone through as a president, right. the way Washington, D.C. just didn't accept him as a legitimate president because of who he was, because of where he came from, that she saw him as the first <laughs> Black president. So we spent the whole night talking mostly about him and about my role as, as uh, first Cyrus. Um Things didn't pan out exactly as I imagined, but it was an amazing night. And I found out that she was human and she was so inquisitive about everybody, about life, about how we interact with each other. And I, had, I went away from that having so much more respect and a feeling of connection to her mm -hmm. as a fellow writer. Um, and I always remember that one that one connection with her. And when she passed away, I thought about that a lot. I wish I had known her better, but I, I'm very happy that I had that interaction with her. Uh, so let me just close by saying for as long as I can remember learning about the great Toni Morrison, uh, I have admired her from afar. Yet there is so much I didn't know about her. What I've learned about her through that short but intimate evening will live with me for forever. And from my own research, I've come to realize that in fact, Toni Morrison's past prepared her for her mm -hmm. writing journey and for her greatness, even before her own birth. Her parents' lives pinned her name across the stars. She was born again in Lorraine to Rama, also Willis, Rama Willis, and George Wofford. She was the second of four children from a working class family. Her mother was born in Greenville, Alabama, and then migrated. Um, and her father grew up in Carterville, Georgia. Mm. And he left Carterville when he was 15 after he saw uh, a lynching uh, on his street. Whites lynched two men, two black businessmen, who lived on his street, and he left Carterville after that. Morrison has said he never told us that he'd seen the bodies, but he had seen them, and that was too traumatic, I think, for him. Soon after the lynching, George Wofford moved to the racially integrated town of Lorraine, Ohio, in hope of escaping racism and securing employment in Ohio's industrial economy. Mm. He worked odd jobs and he worked as a welder for US Steel. Uh, and his wife was a homemaker and a devout member of the African Methodist, Methodist Episcopal Church. Episcopal Church. Uh, when Morrison was about two, her family's landlord set fire to the house in which they lived Good while Lord. they were home because <laughs> her parents couldn't afford to pay rent. Her family responded to what she called this bizarre form of evil by laughing at the landlord. So that that actually uh, demonstrated to her how to react to atrocities. Uh, and I think she held on to that for a long time. They instilled in her a sense of heritage and language through telling traditional African-American folk tales, ghost stories, and singing songs. Morrison also read frequently as a child. Among mm -hmm. her favorite authors were Jane Austen and Leo Tol Tolstoy. Right. She became a Catholic at the age of 12. Um, so that's kind of my take on Toni Morrison. She was an amazing woman. And I think a lot of the fact that she was so amazing and brilliant was she came from strong roots, her parents and her love for reading. I mean, any author that you talk to, 
they'll tell you that that love for reading was, you know, what started it all. It was the fact Absolutely. I've never met an author or a writer who didn't love reading from very, very early on. It's just so important. And that's why what you do, Donna, and what um, your partner in the reading, this reading festival, it is so, so important for our children. It really is. And, and I'm so glad that uh, you decided to take the time to be with us today. I want to not let, I would be remiss if we did not talk about your newest venture, Mahalia, which I think is is phenomenal. I did not realize how, until you told me um, you were going to do a book on her life, Mahalia Jackson. I didn't realize how intricately involved she was in the civil rights movement. She was a singer, you know what I mean? We really didn't know the background history. We didn't know that she spent all that time with um, uh, Martin Luther King. We it, Just so many things, right? So just, you know, don't give away the book, of course, but tell us why it is that you felt her words and her life had to be put on paper. Thank you. Thank you for that opportunity. And I'm, I'm really honored to be writing her story. Uh, of course, there are other books on her, but this will be the first time that an African-American woman has written her story. Mm. And I just feel that it's extremely important. Extremely. Uh, extremely important. Uh, historians like to tell you that they write objectively that they don't, you know, they don't look left, they don't look right, they're just writing truth. That can't be true. We bring everything that we are to our writing, whether we're writing someone else's stories or we're writing our own. So my position with Mahalia Jackson is we can't tell her whole story unless an African-American who have experienced many of the same uh, things that she experienced can tell her stories. Mm -hmm. And especially someone who came from the South and experienced a lot of the South uh, can tell her stories. I believe there is a certain amount of truth that we as African Americans bring to our stories. Just as they can probably, whites can do a better job, I'm right. sure, right. of stories of whites. So I just feel it's extremely important for me to tell her story. And that's the one part of it. The other part is I am drawn to her story. I am drawn to her. She's a singer, yes. And that's what we all know about her. But she's an amazing human being. Mm. She is amazing from her childhood on. The things that she withstood, the things that she uh, challenged whites back in the day, and, and she won. Right. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, she was a strong woman, mm. persistent. She couldn't have made it where she was. She was considered one of the wealthiest women, if not the wealthiest woman for a time uh, in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Um, so she she's an amazing human being, uh, more than just being a singer. And then that relationship, with Martin Luther King Jr., mm. which kind of changed her whole oh, uh, trajectory. Dynamic. Yes, yes. Yeah, it really exactly. did. It really did. It really did. And I just think that is a huge uh, part that a lot of people have missed, uh, mm -hmm. not told, and how important it was, not just for her, but it was important to Martin Luther King Jr. as well. And I want to, I want to share that with, with uh, the world. I want people to know about that relationship. It was an amazing one. And and tell me, so we're still looking at October 2021? We're still looking at October. I'm pushing forward. <laughs> pushing forward. I know, I know. I know. And, <laughs> because people don't understand that, uh, you know, writing takes time. It's not something, you know, you have to set the time aside. You have to be laser focused yeah. because everything from the outside can really distract you from Absolutely. where you're at really and Absolutely. so and people really must understand that if you if you love a writer whoever you are out there you must understand that that time has to be given 
to be yes. laser focused on things like what really happened during that era. Yes. You know, like the person in your book can't go get water, a uh, bottle of water when it's you know, right. 1947 because <laughs> they didn't have a bottle of water in 1947. So you have to be very laser focused on what you're yes. writing and, and, and doing the background on it. And so I, I can't wait to read Mahalia because just just the fact that you decided to write her book, I said, well, there must be something about that. I don't know. And and so in my research, I found out that there's a whole lot about yes. Mahalia yes. Jackson. I did not know. Now you mm-hmm. did, I think you gave us a snippet about how you found something from long mm-hmm. ago. Could you just I tell us really? Did. Sure. Uh, I, my husband and I lived in Chicago for seven years. And during that time, we befriended uh, a couple um, and, and the gentleman, Mr. Barris, Roland Barris, he was the comptroller for the state of Illinois for several years. But he also had purchased Mahalia Jackson's home. And when we went to dinner with them to their home, we had no idea that they lived in her you know, her home, but we got there and he, they started telling us about it and we were fascinated, of course. And then before I left, he went upstairs and came down with this box, these boxes of documents. And they were documents that Mahalia Jackson had left in the house when she left up in the attic. And he shared some, he didn't give me all of them, but he gave me- Of course not. (laughs) (laughs) But he gave me some of them. Uh, And I said, oh, okay. He said, no, you have to promise that you're gonna write something if I'm gonna give these to you. And I said, yeah, sure, I am. Uh, But it was a while, it's been a while. That was uh, over 10 years ago. And um, so I guess about two or three years ago, I started really going through everything and just getting more fascinated and more fascinated by her life and by um, just her journey. Mm. Her journey is just amazing. But that was God speaking to me, I mean, for certain. And I knew I had to write the book. Uh, So I'm doing it now. I'm doing it now. It's all divine timing. You know, you can't get away from that. That's just the way it is, right? And the journey is not where you begin. It's where you end. Uh Uh-huh. I absolutely believe that. And so now we're at the point where you're ready to write it, and I'm ready to read it. I can't wait for you to read it. uh, No, I can't can't wait to read it. And so thank you so much uh, for spending the afternoon with us. Uh, you've been on Zoom My, and on a first conversation on many occasions. I do hope you yes. will join us on many more occasions. I pledge you. It, it's important. And um, thank you for contributing to the International Great Black Read Aloud Day. Well, most people don't understand. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not easy to read out loud, right? It's and not. So, <laughs> it's not. You yes. really have to stay focused on what you're reading. And thank you uh-huh. so much, Janice. Please, uh, love to your husband and your family. And um, keep warm. Thank you. Same to right. you. Same right. to you. Good afternoon. Bye bye. Bye. We'll see you again. I know you will. <laughs>